Mike Mishanta, one of the senior solutions architects over here on the Cloud Health by VMware team. And today I'm going to be walking through uh, FinOps and how you can leverage Cloud Health to achieve better FinOps outcomes. Uh, just a quick agenda. We're going to be talking briefly about the Cloud Center of Excellence and the Cloud Maturity Model. Uh, then we're going to deep dive into the FinOps principles, inform, optimize, operate. So what is the Cloud Center of Excellence and what is the Cloud Maturity Model? So these are slides that we generally start every presentation with, regardless of how advanced you are in the public cloud, because it's really a foundational understanding of, of how can we bring together these disparate groups from our companies and achieve better business outcomes for whether we're operating primarily public, hybrid first, AWS, Azure, Google, OCI. And what we found is there's a cloud center of excellence and there's a million different names for it. You know, you got the cloud business office, cloud capability center, I won't list all the names. And they do a lot of different things you know, from executing the cloud strategy to determining best practices and KPIs that you want to track and adopt. But at the end of the day, what everybody in this group is focused on is driving better business outcomes. The Cloud Center of Excellence, this is another way of looking at it. And, and what you see here is a different illustration where you can see those different groups coming together. You have the FinOps practitioners, you have cloud operations teams, you have security architects. And underneath that, you can kind of get an idea of generally where they fall within the organization. Uh, and at the end of the day, like I said, they're all consuming different things. They're all trying to achieve different outcomes. But by bringing together those different perspectives, you'll be able to be more successful. So this is the cloud maturity model and these this the maturity here is not a definition of hey how long we've we been in the cloud we're really good at it but more along the lines of complexity where, where how complex are the challenges we're trying to solve so what you see is when you're down here in this lower left corner it's visibility it all starts with visibility and there's these three interconnected but yet separate streams of operating and at all phases of your cloud journey you're going to be trying to solve all these different challenges across all three streams together, right? So it starts with visibility. How, where is this coming from? Optimization, where can I identify waste? Where can I achieve better efficiency by doing reservations or savings plans? Governments and automation, how can I put in place guardrails for operating centrally, but, or for governing centrally while we have all these different teams all over the country, all over the world operating independently. And then finally, business integration. How do we develop KPIs that we can track consistently and timely to ensure that we're, we are hitting our goals and tracking towards our objective outcomes? So this is a way of looking at that. I'm gonna build this out really quick differently, right? Focusing on just the financial management piece, looking more towards the FinOps side of things, uh, which is what we're talking about today. So, <clears throat> Being able to accurately identify cost and usage for a show back and charge back. Identifying areas of optimization, as I mentioned just a slide ago. Automating cost control measures and delegating actions to teams so that when they sign in, they see their data and they can make informed decisions that way. And then finally, working with you to continuously optimizing costs based on whatever your objective goals are from an overall organization standpoint. All right, well, that was helpful, you know, setting the stage, but what does that actually mean, right? So how do I get this information now, but I really needed it yesterday or three weeks ago when we were asked. So I'm gonna start with just a um, slide from the FinOps Foundation where defining it, what is it? It's shorthand for cloud financial operations, cloud financial management or cloud cost management. And really what it is, is a cultural practice where these different groups are coming together from different areas. As you can see, there's these different stakeholders and they're forming a cloud center of excellence to drive better outcomes by establishing best practices and making sure all these different teams are held accountable to certain standards. So this should be something in some shape or form that every organization has. It's just a matter of how defined it is. These are challenges that everybody's trying to solve today. Usually if there's nothing centralized in place, it's independent work streams. And by forming something along the lines of a cloud center of excellence or cloud governance committee, you saw the, all the different names a few slides ago, you're able to better achieve those outcomes faster. And how are you doing that? Well, it starts in these three phases, informing, getting visibility, creating accountability, identifying usage patterns, identifying cost origination, setting up access in such a way where people only see their data. It then leads directly into optimization, how do we optimize? How do we get these teams to do it themselves? How do we do things centrally where it makes sense, such as reservations or savings plans management? And then finally, how do we operate? How do we execute? How do we hit those business goals? How do we track against them accurately? How do we develop KPIs? 
And what you see is there's no arrows, right? Similar to the cloud maturity model, they're, they're, they're interconnected, iterative, ongoing. You can go from informing to operating. You can go from optimizing back to informing. You can go from inf uh, optimizing directly to operating. All these different work streams are happening continuously, but by breaking these down into certain sections, uh, the FinOps Foundation and, and Cloud Health and, and the market has found that you're able to achieve excellence. So this is a slide in Cloud Health. I'm gonna rip through this really quick and, and continue uh, showing you how we align to it, but how is the Cloud Health platform going to help you do this? You can see the listed integrations from a hyperscaler standpoint up here. You have the, or the CSPs, you have AWS, OCI, Oracle, uh, Google, VMware Cloud Foundations, and hybrid environments are available as well, whether or not we're hosting them ourselves or in a colo facility. Right? So being able to centralize all of that usage information and the corresponding costs into unified views, such as this multi-cloud dashboard you're looking at in the screenshot. Then being able to identify um, optimization opportunities, as I've said now, you know, 10 times, right-sizing the infrastructure, analyzing the actual utilization patterns against our internal performance requirements and getting customized recommendations based on what those are and, and what, we, what changes might we want to consider making, going from uh, a C4 8 extra large to a C4 4 extra large, for example, based on low max CPU utilization. And then finally, putting in place the governance and in some cases automation to, to execute remediation of waste or uh, reservation purchases to, to achieve efficiencies where it makes sense to automate. Uh, and you can see here, you know, how, how has this been successful? Well, we now have over $20 billion in, in annualized cloud spend under management and, and across our customer base, over 150,000 governance policies enabled to help customers scale their management. So how does what I just showed you apply to FinOps? And how can we help you achieve excellence in each one of these different domains? And it breaks down into understanding your cloud cost and usage, tracking performance and setting up benchmarks, leading directly into optimization so you can make better decisions and as close to real time as possible and optimize your rates, whether it's in a negotiation back to Microsoft because you went way over your commitment, or it's in doing activities like right sizing or you've identifying volume discounts for your reservation purchases. <clears throat> and finally getting down to the optimized phase, actually seeing how you're doing from a consumption standpoint and are there areas where maybe these workloads don't make sense to be on EC2 or they should be in Lambda because it only exists for a little bit. And working with you up from an organizational alignment standpoint to, to develop those KPIs and ensure that everybody is speaking the same language when it comes down to how are we trying to operate in the public cloud and how are we trying to be efficient? What's that actually look like? What's going on in there? So it all starts in the informed phase and getting a better understanding of, of where your cloud usage and cost is coming from. Pulling from all those providers and then being able to group things dynamically based on your metadata. And that's where Cloud Health is really going to help you excel. Being able to report on your applications, being able to report on your line of businesses, your cost centers, your, your cost codes, your functional purpose of the infrastructure, the however these stakeholders from those different organizations are being asked to look at the infrastructure, interpreting the metadata into group sets so that you can dynamically allocate it and then report and track against it to make sure that the, the usage that was expected is what's being incurred. So, you know, this slide tells the tale, the high level picture, and I'm gonna tell you a story in four screenshots slash four reports, because I wanted to make sure I was able to cover all these pillars. Otherwise you'd be seeing a live demo. Um, allocating the infrastructure to these groups, being able to create even more advanced reports using uh, flex reports, which is a, a different, a slightly different data set, uh, think of it as like a, a queryable uh, engine uh, along the lines of GCP BigQuery, where you can actually manipulate the billing file of record more granularly and summarize that information by tags and other data. Uh, and, and what that might look like is right here, you know, using perspectives, which are group sets, to drill down from a high level overall picture of what our spend is going back 13 months by service. That's what you're looking at here categorizing by environment, 
using a perspective or a group set again, you can see that right here, environment gets brought in through this dimension here called category and being able to report on our cost by production, our cost by staging, development, management, a sandbox environment that may or may not, that may have spend that should not be there anymore. And trending it that way and identifying these cost patterns and these usage patterns, filtering to production and categorizing now again by the functional purpose, excuse me, within that infrastructure, within that production environment, what are we spending that money on? And is it important? Is it meaningful? What information can I derive from this? And then finally, filtering to our Spark cluster, which you see here is our biggest cost driver now, going back almost a year where cube workers were a little ahead of it. And then above that, we had some cost allocation workers, but Spark cluster going from around, uh, say 400,000 and just visual math right there, all the way up to close to a million dollars in spend in December back down a little bit in January, but trending back up in February. So within that cluster, within that workload, the functional purpose that is our Spark environment in running in production, costing us this, who is responsible for it? And what services are they actually consuming? So being able to go from that high level, in some cases over $4 million a month after accounting for credits, Here's what Ben is spending in production in January on his Spark infrastructure, broken down at the service level. 210,000 in compute, another 200 in Elastic MapReduce, about 100,000 in EBS storage. We can see the Zeus team spending much less, Zhu less, Ernie less, and then our shared cost down here. So being able to align your requirements from reporting and a visibility standpoint to these group sets based on your metadata. And you may be hearing that and thinking, oh, tagging, great. Tagging's hard to do, it's inconsistent. That's one of the things that perspectives doesn't re require entirely. Tags are a great place to start, but it doesn't discriminate from the metadata. And what we're doing is identifying however you organize it, if it's a naming convention, if it's a VPC ID, if it's a resource group name, looking at all of that and creating rules to allocate the infrastructure to these buckets so that you're able to get this granular drill down, so that you're able to group things properly, put them into custom dashboards and accurately report against it. Because if you can't understand where these costs are coming from, you can't optimize it, you can't govern it. Even if it's from a usage standpoint, you're looking at cost reports, the same patterns hold true looking at instance hours, looking at virtual machine hours consumed, looking at SQL database hours. We need to know where it's coming from in the context of our business, not just the region, not just the service, not just the cloud account or resource group, but putting it back into the context of what we care about. Um, are, are these graphs coming from an, an interface somewhere or is this data that you have exported and pivoted off yourself to, to give stack bar charts? Great question. These are directly from the Cloud Health platform. Um, so I, I chose bar charts for the for simplicity purposes, but it's a SaaS platform. Uh, we were actually acquired by VMware about three and a half years ago now. Um, so we were a startup based out of the Boston area, providing these uh, providing cloud cost management and governance um, as a service to our customers. And VMware was one of them prior to the acquisition. Actually, actually. So what you see here is a bar chart. You can do line, area, pie, stacks, grouped, um, horizontal, vertical, all that kind of stuff. So I just kept it bar for simplicity. But you're looking at screenshots directly from the cloud platform here. What you're looking at here from a tile standpoint, um, the services. So the blue bar is compute, red is S3. There's a, the next charge is the savings plans up, up front free Amazon S3 services, EC2 usage credits. S3 API charges, MapReduce costs. This breakdown is by environment, giant blue bar is production. So we've changed that category from service to environment, bringing it down by production, dev, test, staging, QA. Um, the next filter, filter to production, change the category to functional function, which it, think of it as the purpose of the infrastructure. What is it actually doing? What is it actually supporting? So we have Spark, Cube Workers, cost allocation, workers, elastic search, data stores, containers, processors, um, EKS, collectors, Kubernetes environment that um, self-managed. So it's just each report is drilling down to the different context with the final categorization you see in the bottom right. 
We filter to Spark, which is right here, this blue cost. So roughly $1.1 million last month. Here we're looking at about three and a half million in production costs. Overall, we're looking at $4 million in charges in January. So they go from 4 million to three and a half million to 1.1 to breaking down that 1.1 million for January by owner on the x-axis. So we have Ben, Zeus team, Zhu, Ernie, and then Amazing. by service item up here. So compute, map reduce, storage. Does that help? Uh, oh. Yeah, I think we can appreciate that the, the system is able to provide insight. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay, yeah, I was I just keep... going to ask you the same question. I mean, this is really cool, but what can we do after, you know, uh, interpreting all this data with the nice graphic? I mean, what are the actions that the software can do dollars from my cloud bill? And can, okay. and, and can we step back just a bit further for that and just say, how on earth are you going to identify what all that resource actually is and who it belongs to? Because mm -hmm. you mentioned tagging as a, as a poor way of actually identifying resources. I would say that if, um, if you were using tagging as your only method, I'd just add somebody else's tags to my resources and just let them pay for it. Oh, good idea. <laughs> yeah, fair point, fair point. No, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. I've, I've, I've seen people do it. Um, well, absolutely. Funny you say that Ernie on this graph is, has done that. Um, yeah. So tags are great. It's the most granular way of doing so. With the exception of Kubernetes there, you're going to want to use like pod labels or something like that. And we start there nine, 98 times out of 100, we'll start there. But the perspective engine itself isn't reliant solely on tags. It looks at all of the metadata we've collected. So we're making scheduled API calls as granular as every 15 minutes to the services themselves. So the Git list describe compute, the get your virtual machines, get your GCP compute instances, and pulling all of that data in. So we see the names, we see what it's associated with, we see the storage accounts, we see the IP addresses, the EBS volumes, the snapshots, the images, uh, the AMIs, all that stuff we see. So what the perspective engine does is look at all of that and create rules to allocate the infrastructure accordingly. Now, there's a lot of cases, especially with the enterprise, where customers are using a CMDB of sorts, like a service now. And where that's the case, we have APIs in place that our customers have used, and we've, we've, we've taken the root custom integration because everyone's using ServiceNow differently. It's the power of ServiceNow. You can make it do what you need it to do from a CMDB standpoint. So if, if those attributes exist in a, in a separate system, we've built custom integrations to allow us to enrich the metadata we're seeing directly with the source of truth that is the CMDB to provide this level of visibility. So if all that fails, we look at like account names and resource group names, and we try to build out those associations based on what those resources are talking to using constructs like a gather tree. So like an EC2 instance, or for, for example, an EC2 instance has an EBS volume. That volume has snapshots. That instance also has elastic IP address or addresses. So if I group the instance, bring all of that with it. If I allocate a resource group, bring with it all of the resources running underneath that group on the Azure side. That's how you'll get this visibility. Question on that. Um, so clearly, clearly tagging is a key piece. So we, we highlighted mm -hmm. one of the key places where tagging can, can fail, if you will. What, I guess, how do you balance all this extra information you're pulling in with the tags? Does one take priority over the other? If we tag something, does that um, mean more than the, the analytics that you're running within the environment? A great question. So here's is where you're playing a balancing game between value count and overall coverage. So you're looking for, think of them as lenses into your business. And typically what you see is seven to 10 overall broader group sets. And the common themes you'll see are environment, owner, cost center, cost code, line of business, application. So there's, there's, there's very common categories that, that we've seen across all of our customers. And, and what we try to do is get you as close to 100% allocated as possible. 
you can see here, I've, oh, you can't see here, but there's a grayed <laughs> off cube here called the missing environment tag that I just ignored for the sake of the demo. I just clicked it and it disappears off the chart. So grouping the infrastructure that we can't identify into something else. Where are these costs that we can't directly attribute to a resource? Where are these costs that we want to suppress and actually build our own custom charges? So I'm, I'm speaking, alluding more towards advanced features such as cost reallocation, isolating those shared costs and distributing them proportionally to the groups that incurred them or taking um, like a support charge and evenly distributing it across every group based on the EC2 compute charges inside it or saying, hey, this group gets 30%, this group gets 40%, this group gets 10% and doing it on a fixed allocation basis. We're also potentially putting in a custom line item charge that credits 100% against AWS support charges. So in the reports, it zeroes out. And then you can create a second custom line item charge and add your own support charge into the system so that when you're doing a show back to the line of business at the account level, your custom support charges will show versus what Amazon's just putting in the billing file. So you could do some custom uplift and cost reallocation that way to get you as close to 100% as possible. So I remember my train of thought, it's a balancing act between the number of groups and the overall coverage. We're trying to get you as 100% covered as, as close to 100% as possible. So if I change this category and I drop down by environment, you just see the environment groups. You don't see something called other or assets not allocated. It sounds like this is where the, the human element of FinOps comes into play is kind of defining, exactly. defining that structure, making those tweaks, uh, defining whatever rules need to exist for that particular environment. Exactly. Uh, what does finance care about? Cost center, project, line of business. What are we budgeting for? What does IT operations care about? Functional purpose of the infrastructure. What does DevOps care about? Making sure production doesn't fall down. So perspectives, which is why I said balancing the, the seven to 10 lenses into your business with the coverage overall, because we're trying to answer those questions being asked earlier. What is going on? And each individual group within the FinOps team, within the Cloud Center of Excellence, is going to have different requirements on how they look at that data. So when you're creating those perspectives, it's really, a, it's, it is a conversation. It's understanding, okay, what do you need to look at? taking it one step further, what are you going to go do with it, right? Is that getting fed into an ERP system like Oracle? Is that just going into an Excel workbook where finance is going to run some macros and do some recapitalization of pre-purchases over $100,000? In this report, can I analyze also how much, you know, the resources utilize? I mean, so for example, I'm using the wrong instances and most yep. of them are empty. So, and so, or... Uh, I allocated uh, 10 terabytes of capacity, but actually I'm using one and yep. things like that. So that I can, or, you know, the workload actually could run on a very, on a very different uh, tier of storage and make me save a lot of money. Yes, you can. Cloud usage optimization. So right sizing analysis, looking at the Utilization of the EC2 instances of the SQL database DTU and model, looking at the Azure virtual machines or the GCP compute instances, the actual utilization, the CPU, the memory, the file system, the disk IO, the network IO, building a policy that tracks your requirements. My application, for example, is compute intensive. If max CPU is ever less than 40%, I want to get a recommendation on something I could do differently because I want my max to be at 60%. Always. I just want it cooking along right in that range, doing its thing. So yes, that's available. Uh, it will provide you the recommendations. It takes into account your negotiated pricing on the Azure side, um, potentially on the Amazon side, depending on how your, your discount might be structured. Um, and then taking that one step further, going back one, optimizing rates. So the best practice is right sizing. Then identifying stable usage that you might want to consider reserving or purchasing a savings plan against. So the rationale there is if I go from a C4, eight extra large to a C4, four extra large, the general rule of thumb, your hourly rate is going to be about cut in half if you go down a full half size. So that's about, a, again, rough math, 50% savings there hourly. You add a reservation on top of that or a savings plan on top of that, that's an additional 30% 
an hourly cost you can save. So by doing a right sizing exercise first, then going back and purchasing a savings plan commitment or a reservation, and now doing a reservation purchase in Azure, for example, you'll be able to uh, double dip on your savings. And the benefit of savings plans and reservations too is you're probably gonna save the money against that specific resource, but the discounting is applied randomly based on the usage profile. In the case of reservations, you're looking at the family of the resource, the C4s, the C8s, the um, C5s, all within the same family, but you're also looking at the region. So in the case of reservations, they're, they're on, in Amazon, there's some operating system constraints to size flexibility. You don't have to worry about it as much anymore with savings plans because you're just reserving the actual hourly commitment now or covering the hourly commitment, I should say. Uh, but you're able to identify usage patterns centrally. This is where the Cloud Center of Excellence really delivers tremendous amounts of value because this group up here, the top level organization, the Cloud Center of Excellence exists up here. They're looking at all the usage from all those different business units, all those different teams. And they're identifying stable on-demand usage that has an extended pattern. So if something is on demand consistently for months, you can purchase a commitment against it and get an understanding on the reservation side of a payback period, your break even point, your effective cost savings from a monthly and annual standpoint, whether it's a one year or three year term. And if you cover 30% of that and you're still 70% on demand, that provides you enough flexibility to, to go change instance sizes, to, to take a workload off of EC2 and move it to Lambda or Fargate, if it makes sense to do that, to invest in Kubernetes, whether it's EKS or you're doing a COPS deployment and doing a self-managed environment, uh, to, to get that visibility and get that control. Best practice, reservations, 60 to 70% covered. Savings plans, we're seeing people and companies get as high as 95% from a discount standpoint. And they can do that because they're using, in the case of our customers, Cloud Health, to identify those usage patterns. And with savings plans, you can specify the total coverage. And as you continue to grow your cloud investment, looking at your overall cloud investment, it's growing. VMware is investing more. Cloud Health is investing more. Our spend is only going up, up, and up. So what is 90% covered today from a discount standpoint? 90% of my consumed hours are covered by a discount. That's what this total coverage is targeting. I can run this recommendation every single day, every single week, every single month, make that a KPI and track against it. And using an API potentially as well, where you can get these recommendations programmatically, execute those purchases as soon as you're below 90%, get yourself back to 90%. And in three months, that 90 might be 85. And you can make an incremental purchase there again as well. And depending on the purchase model, no upfront, partial upfront, all upfront, you can outlay your capital differently to achieve tremendous amounts of savings. So for, for by that, I mean the savings percent between the all upfront three-year USA rate here is 31.6%. But the partial upfront is 30.9%. The upfront cost is 2X. So for 4.4 million, I can save about 31%. Or for 8.9 million, almost 9 million, I can save 31.6. So the delta here in savings, 109,000 a month in effective cost savings versus 114,000 a month in effective cost savings. I can just tell you, I can find a better way to use that, that $4 million for five thousand dollars a month in savings. Can I, just, so, can I just interrupt and ask you a, or make an obvious statement here? Yes. Well, first of all, um, you're talking a lot about savings, but if you didn't spend that money in the first place because you'd overallocate it, if because you hadn't overallocated, then that saving wouldn't be relevant, and you wouldn't need to talk about it as much. So there's an element here of right sizing the deployment before you even start. The second thing is. I haven't seen you talk about the idea of cost of recovery or cost of change to show the ROI of how you actually get that money back. So for instance, refactoring the app to put it under Lambda or changing to a, a different um, instance type and so on. There's a cost of implementation that we haven't talked about, which seems to be uh, needed to be included in here because there might be some changes that 
become too expensive to actually implement because the saving isn't worth it, or the ROI is you know five years and therefore you'll never see that money back. Great point, which is why we see with how people structure cloud health and align it to their systems, to their organizational structure, you empower those teams at these, these lower organizational units within that hierarchy to make those decisions. So at the end of the day, our recommendations are just math, right? You're, you're, you're providing a, a governance policy that tells us what you care about from a performance standpoint. But from a mathematics, it's going from this size to this size based on the utilization, here's how much you would save, right? And there's, we're gonna provide the cost savings. But that's 80% of the story. The contextual nature of what you're trying to accomplish and what the goals are will help you finish that. So what we see is through, through enablement, right? So through training, through onboarding, through uh, self-paced training and best practice sessions with your know, technical account manager where they're providing those recommendations. Those, those, those development teams, the IT operations teams, the, the DevOps teams will be able to make recommendations to these lower levels. And then they can take their knowledge of what they know the application is doing, what they know the workload was intended for, to make a more informed decision. So we won't just give you one recommendation, we'll give you a, a couple. And then you can choose what's most appropriate and, and see what, what the savings impact there. And in the case of Azure, for example, we'll make assumptions if we don't have a metric. 99% utilization for memory, for example. So we can give you a recommendation, but it's more conservative because we're assuming basically 100% utilization, but you can, if you were to take that at face value, you would have at least that much memory on the new size going from a D32 V3 to a D6 or an F18. You, you will know, I'm, I'm making those up on top of my head, but you'll have that context and we'll provide that information to you. So it's, it's a combination of here's the recommendation, here's the data in front of you, visualize it, go back and trend it, go look at a performance chart so you can see the spikes at the hourly granularity, put that next to the recommendation to make that more informed decision. So that's part of the cloud center, that's part of the benefit of the cloud center of excellence model, being able to bring those disparate viewpoints where somebody from finance would see that recommendation and be like, what are you doing? Why does this have max CPU memory and disk less than 30%? That alone is saying you're wasting a ton of money. Tell me what's going on. And if you can justify it, that's fine. So what ends up happening is, although right sizing is a very onerous task, it's time consuming. It's something that we do help a lot of people out with. Uh, it's, it's a collaboration and bringing those people together so that they can make the bit more informed decision with all of the context, with the cost analysis, with the usage analysis next to the recommendation so that they can be confident it's the right thing to do for the business. Uh, and then what's the last step, right? So we talked about informing, we talked about optimi optimizing, making better real-time decisions, identifying right-sizing opportunities, we, operating, we talked about just now, right? How do we structure the platform in such a way where it aligns to our business and we can inform those teams and partner with them to make sure they're making better decisions. But finally, how do we implement best practices? And this is where the platform provides a lot of this, but the, the partnership between you uh, as a user and your technical account manager to have that those ongoing conversations where we will give you best practices. We will benchmark you against your peers, anonymized, of course, so that you can see how you stack rank against everybody. And, and what are key use cases that are popping up? Where are we seeing people leverage secure state, for example, to do this really cool thing with remediation uh, that no one's thought of before, but people are starting to adopt and it's taking off. How can we put in place governance policies to identify waste before we hit that cost sprawl? When I have an EBS volume unattached for five days, I want Cloud Health to take a snapshot to the volume. I'd rather pay for the snapshot than the volume. When I have snapshots older than 24 months, just delete them or use an API to get those IDs in JSON format and then put them in Glacier storage because maybe there's a, regu uh, a regulatory requirement to keep those uh, assets for 24 months, put them in Glacier for another year. 
So there's there's a lot you can do with cloud health from an overall strategy standpoint standpoint to achieve success. And the FinOps model we found is a great way of doing so because it breaks it down in such a way where everybody's coming together to drive better outcomes. And they're all bringing their points of view to the table, which is what we want. That's how you will be successful as you shift from the traditional uh, data center model into a public cloud first or adopt a hybrid approach. Cloud Health will be there with you, whether we're, we're integrated with vRealize or we're integrating directly into the cloud providers only, but we'll be there with you to partner with you to help you be successful. So the platform's great, but it really comes down to more a collaboration as well as, 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 well as the solution.